Hey guys, today's video is on three things. Janelle and I are going to share number one, the Eucharistic miracles of St. Pascal, number two, the purpose of miracles, and number three, some personal miracles that we, we have witnessed in our life. Enjoy. I like miracles. I know, they're so important, and that's why we need to learn about them and talk about them and read about them. Yeah, so we hope that this video kind of encourages you in your faith. You know, sometimes we don't hear about miracles very often, and so you've been learning more about specifically St. Pascal. So uh, every single month I run these online faith and fitness groups, and for the month of May, this month, I'm leading one called Miraculous May. So. So every single day I'm sharing a different miracle story, either it's from our own personal life or a saint's life or from the Bible, but just to talk about how God is a God of miracles and how he wants to continue working in our life even today. And so I shared this story uh, just a couple days ago about St. Pascal and we actually named our youngest son Pascal after this saint because he was born on the feast of Corpus Christi and someone had mentioned to us that it would be fitting to have a Eucharistic saint as his namesake. So St. Pascal is who we chose and this is his story. So as a young baby, his mother brought him to Mass and during the elevation, so when the priest lifts the host and it becomes the body of Jesus, St. Pascal, as a baby, began to shake. And his mother was like, oh, what's going on here? And her heart began to race because she was like, is it possible that as a baby, he is able to recognize the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist? So it was the first thing that happened. And then shortly after that, he wasn't even able to walk yet, but he went missing and they couldn't find him. And so his mother asked God, show me where my baby is. And you know where she found him? On the steps to the sanctuary at the church. And again, just looking up at the tabernacle. So it was like at a very, very young age, he had this devotion to Jesus in the Eucharist. As he became a young boy, he was a shepherd in the field, tending to his father's sheep. And he liked to get to mass every single day, but sometimes he wasn't able to. And on those days, he was able to hear the church bells ring during the elevation because at that time, they would ring the bells during the elevation. Isn't that beautiful? I'm like, can we get back to that practice? That'd be so great. Like what an evangelization mm -hmm. to the neighborhood, right? Anyhow, um, it was said that even sometimes angels would come and bring him the Eucharist in the field. And he, there's even um, documentation that there was another boy, a friend of his, who saw angels bringing him the Eucharist. Really? I just think like, what an incredible experience. And then as he grew up into an adult, he wanted to become a brother and devote more time to prayer and service to God and the church. And so he became a Franciscan brother. There's a whole bunch more to his story, but I'm just going to skip right to the end here. Um, he ends up dying, and at his funeral mass, he's lying there, and during the elevation, again, the consecration, the priest lifts up the host. Who sits up in his coffin? St. Pascal. And there's a lady who's even like, whoa, look, there's Brother Pascal. He's opened his eyes. And like, what an interesting experience that would have been for everybody <laughs> at that funeral. Can you imagine? Sometimes I'm like, did they make this up? <laughs> but why would somebody make up a story about a saint? I'm going to say that it was true. <laughs> I think, what do you want people to say at your funeral? <laughs> Look, he's moving. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> it sure is. So that's who our son's named after. Right. Um do you have additional? Well, I just want to say that's just one story of many, like of thousands and upon thousands of stories. And I just think, you know, how how good it is for us to talk about these stories. And um, so here in our home, we try to read regularly stories of the saints just to encourage our kids to remember that, you know, God's fingerprints are all over the place. Like he's he's active, he's alive, he's moving. And so some of the resources that we've been using, so for example, um, I get all of my resources from other people, just so you know, it's not of my own doing. Like I, I get recommendations from other people. These ones are all about Saints of the Eucharist. They're by Father Francis, and actually they're kind of hard to come by. They're written a long time ago. Um, so if you can find them, Saints of the Eucharist, there's a, a part one and a part two. And then another series that I really love because it's historical, I want to say historical fiction, but it's based on the lives of the saints. And, and often I've tried to uh, make sure that some of the some of the facts that are shared in these books are actually authentic. And when I have double checked, it, it they've turned out to be true. It's a series by Mary Fabian Windiot. I hope I'm saying her name properly, but there's so many stories. Like this one, St. Rose of Lima. Another really good one that we read was um, The Children, The Fatima Children. Oh, such a good story. And then also this one is very short. So if you're kind of like, 
oh, I don't have a lot of time. St. Thomas Aquinas, like even as adults, like for me to read this, I, I love these books. Why does God allow miracles? Why does he perform miracles? Why does he cause the miracles? I think there's two things for our consideration. Number one, it glorifies him. So mm-hmm. it shows forth his glory and it shows forth his goodness. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the his second, power. Yeah. And the second reason is that it's for the good of the people who participate in that miracle. So this is why God does miracles. And in fact, in order to be a Catholic, you have to believe in miracles. If you just think about the Apostles' Creed, uh, you have Jesus who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. That's a miracle. In other words, that doesn't hap- That didn't happen by natural means. It was by supernatural means. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's part of a miracle. It, it, it exceeds the natural order of creation. Um, we have Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. Again, that exceeds what is naturally ordered in creation. Mary was a virgin. She didn't have relations, relations with a man. Jesus was raised on the third day. I mean, that is a miracle of Jesus being raised from the dead. Our whole Christian faith is based upon a miracle. Jesus didn't raise, wasn't raised from the, from the dead, then our faith is in vain. So we, we must believe in miracles. Uh, the last one we say in the Apostles' Creed, Jesus ascended into heaven. He rose up. So you've got a physical body that is, is rising above the law of gravity. <laughs> <laughs> so our Catholic faith is filled with miracles. And I feel sometimes we have mm-hmm. sanitized the faith from miracles, from the supernatural. And such a mistake it is. Mm-hmm. And we have to remember that when God does miracles, it is for our good and for the good of the people who experience it. And so, for example, if God heals somebody of a disease, the end of the purpose of that miracle isn't simply to heal them of a disease. It is because that action was good for them in some way. It benefited their eternal soul. And number two, it glorified God. If you remove one of these aspects, then God would not perform the miracle. Uh, We see God performing miracles also in a variety of different ways. Sometimes he just moves sovereignly. Uh, Other times he, he uses instruments to bring forth a miracle. For example, I think of St. Peter. He's chained in jail in Acts of the Apostles. And an angel goes to him and the chains drop from his hands. That's a miracle. So God used an angel to do the miracle, but God was the author of the miracle. He, the instrument was the angel, but God was the, the, the primary cause of the, the miracle. We see God using people to perform miracles, like through the saints, they pray for people and they're healed. Other times God will use objects to perform a miracle. We see this in the Acts of the Apostles. Acts 19, 11 and 12. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. You know, actually something that happened uh, with our own children, like just thinking about relics, for example. I remember our daughter had very terrible eczema all over her arms. And every night she would put this relic, um, I think it was of St. Therese, on her arms. And and her eczema is gone. And she'll say to people like she was healed by this relic. Well, obviously the intercession of St. Therese. There's an example of like God using an object to bring forth a miracle, but God is the primary cause of every miracle. So I have a question for Ken. Yeah. <laughs> so have you witnessed a miracle? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Like other than the miracles that we see at mass, like transubstantiation, that is a miracle. Well, technically, strictly speaking, uh, it's not. Okay. Uh, because a miracle has to be something that supersedes the natural order of things, and it has to be also perceptible with the senses. Oh, okay. So by definition, I mean, I mean, yeah, in one sense, yes, that's a miracle. But in the way that we're understanding, the church understands miracles, it has to be perceived with the senses. Right. Okay. So the sacraments, for example, would not be considered in the strictest sense a, a miracle. miracle. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So it has to be something that you can see or something that you can like uh, subjectively say is different. That's that's right. That uh, something happened that exceeds the natural order of things. Mm-hmm. 
like Lazarus being raised from the dead. That usually doesn't happen. It's it's an, a supernatural past Saint Pascal coming forth. Bodies just don't aren't dead and just come back to life. Uh, a healing. Okay, so yeah. tell me a modern miracle. So this is something I witnessed early on in ministry. I uh, there was a youth event that I was leading, and we had a time of prayer where people could come and sit down in chairs, and they could mention a need, and that person would pray for them. So. A young girl sat down in a chair with me and she mentioned that she was sick and uh so i she didn't say what she was sick with so i just prayed for her and i just said close your eyes and i'll ask jesus to come and you know work and so she closed her eyes and i just felt prompted by the holy spirit to pray something like god heal her from the top of her head to the tip of her toes because i thought everything is in between there <laughs> and I noticed that while I was praying spontaneously, she, she was moved emotionally. She started to cry. And that at the end of the prayer, she got very excited or uh, I don't want to say hysterical, but really moved. She's like, I think I'm healed. I think I'm healed. And she began to, to hit the back of her head. And, and she jumped up from her chair and she left. And I never had a chance to follow up with her until... I would say then it was about a week, week later where this young woman showed up at one of my youth groups that I was running. And she shared with the whole group that um, she had been diagnosed with this disease that had caused fluid buildup at the base of her skull and that she would have to get it drained regularly because it caused a lot of pressure on her head. Uh, and the doctors told her that she was going to lose her sight because of this pressure buildup around her eyes and that she was going blind and it was irreversible. And that when I prayed, she said she felt this warmth travel from the top of her head, hit the bubble at the base of her skull, the fluid, and she felt that fluid go down her spine, down her legs and out her toes. And so when the prayer was done, she was hitting the back of her head because she was looking for that fluid buildup and it was gone. And this young woman continued to come to my youth group. And a few weeks or maybe a month later, she brought these special pictures of her eyes from the doctor or her specialist. And it showed the change of her eyes and the reverse of the damage that was caused, mm. which was supposed to be permanent because she had lost her peripheral vision. Uh, and so that was restored. And the doctors, I said to you, the doctors told you this was impossible. Um, what do you say? And, it's, and I said, well, the doctor said exceptions can be made, but I told him God healed me. Mm. And um, and I remember having a conversation with this young lady's mom. And just she shared with me the impact that this has had on also her daughter, not, not just physically, but mm -hmm. her heart. So that was a pretty ex extreme example. I've seen others, but that was uh, pretty miraculous. Mm -hmm. And a, a number of years ago, I followed up with this person just to, you know, just to confirm the story and just make sure everything, all the details are right. And indeed, she she's still stuck by everything that she had shared um, as a, an adult now. So it was a beautiful, a beautiful example of a, a miracle that I've seen that, I mean, that God moved mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for the good of the soul of this young woman and for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wants to see a miracle in their life, what do they have to do? Well, it's not out of curiosity. Right. So it, God, these miracles are not trickery. They're not like well, we want to manipulate circumstance. I think the most important thing is thy will be done in everything. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't ask. We have a need that we have exhausted all natural means possible to rectify situation we should thrust ourselves into the providence of God and say, thy will be done and ask for that miracle and then say, thy will be done, whatever God wants. Mm -hmm. It's up to him. He, he's not this magician that performs all these tricks that every request that we have. But if there is something that within God's will that he wants to do, uh, maybe the only reason why it's not being done is because we haven't asked. Well, we should always ask. We should be generous in our asking towards God. I think God is much more generous than we think he actually is. Mm -hmm. So if there's a need in our lives, we should just ask. Yeah. We can ask through the intercession of a saint. We can ask mm -hmm. through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary. We can go before the Blessed Sacrament. 
There's a variety of ways we can do a three day fast in 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 asking God for a miracle. There's 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 all so many ways that we can ask God to mm-hmm. to meet us a supernatural need in our life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And was, maybe you can share with us below um, a miracle that maybe you have witnessed in your life. I would really love reading those comments today. So please share with us below if you've seen something extraordinary happen in your life. Thanks for watching, friends. <laughs>